Have you ever considered how our life is a continual process of adjusting our perspective and uh, therefore adjusting our attitude to things? Um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, I'm standing in the forest and a person next to me is pointing into the distance at something beautiful and exciting and I can't see it. And then I see it. It's a, it's a bird, a very beautiful bird, very colorful. And the person on the other side can't see it. And those of us who can see it are excited to see this beautiful bird. And those who can't see it are growing frustrated that they can't see it. It's a matter of having, we're all looking in the same direction, but we are not able to see the same thing. It's a matter of perspective. And so in this passage, as we are going to be looking at in just a moment, we have Paul adjusting our perspective. He is, he is showing us something in this passage. He's showing us, in fact, an approach to seeing the Bible and seeing ourselves through the gospel. And so... He is helping us gain a proper perspective on life and on Scripture. What Paul is trying to show is that the gospel, the good news, runs through the whole Bible. It is not something new invented in the New Testament. That salvation by faith, that the grace of God that saves, was all through the Bible and through the Old Testament. And that also, another perspective that Paul gives us here in this passage is that those who rely on their works will always feel that they're under a curse. So let's read together Galatians chapter 3 from verse 5. Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Just as Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. It is important for us to see here that Paul is making a contrast here, a blessing and a curse. He's talking about Abraham and those who are the sons of Abraham by faith will be blessed and those who are relying on their works will be cursed or will be under a curse. And the reason why Paul is laboring this point is because we all have a tendency to rely on our commitment, on our moral life, on our faithfulness, on our works. We read the Bible this way. In fact, we look at the people in the Bible in the Old Testament and we say that those who have been devoted to God, who have worked hard, were blessed. And those that failed, those who proved to be weak, were cursed, were, were f failed, did not, were not able to achieve to a status of being close to God. And this is what the, the Judaizers, the teachers that came to the churches in Galatia, they were, they were saying this very similar gospel to the true gospel, but it was not in fact the true gospel. They were saying you must believe in Jesus Christ. This number one. Second, you must obey the law, obey Him. And third, you will be blessed and you will be saved. Paul says this is no gospel. God, Paul's gospel as we see, Christ's gospel as we see in the Bible, is that you believe in Jesus Christ, number one. Second, you are blessed and saved and third, you obey Him. And this is what Paul is trying to show here again and again through the passages that we already studied and the passage here that we are looking at. So Paul continues his argument here showing how the gospel changes our perspective on the Bible and on ourselves. So the first thing that we're going to look at with you today is 
The first thing is we can understand Scripture only through the gospel. That's the first point. We can understand Scripture only through the gospel. This is a valuable lesson that Paul is giving here, here through explaining Abraham and the Old Testament here through Abraham. He is showing us a very valuable lesson on how to understand all Scripture. And that gospel allows us to truly understand the Bible. Look at what Paul is doing here in verse 8. He says, And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. Wow, what a statement here. The Scripture which is very interesting, Scripture and God is equated here. Scripture for seeing and God, but it was actually God speaking to Abraham. But the, the interesting point here, the most interesting thing here is that it says that the Scripture, God preached the gospel to Abraham. From the very beginning, God is preaching the gospel to Abraham, revealing the gospel, that is, the good news to Abraham. So Paul is making a very interesting argument. He is speaking against the Judaizers who believed the Old Testament, who valued Abraham very highly. And he says, Abraham, well, Abraham knew the gospel, the gospel that was preached, the gospel that was revealed by Christ. He believed that gospel. Now, in the Jewish tradition, there are writings of Jewish uh, origin that are interpreting the Old Testament, the, those, in those writings it is clear that they are, they are looking at Abraham and saying that his faithfulness to God produced his acceptance by God. In the book of 1 Maccabees, for example, it says, was not Abraham found faithful when tested, and that was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now, Sarai 44 says this, Abraham was the great father of a multitude of nations, and no one has been found like him in glory. He kept the law of the Most High, and when tested, he proved faithful. So we see that many Jewish writings interpreted Abraham and his acceptance by God as a result of his faithfulness. And what Paul is showing us that from the very beginning, God's acceptance of people, God's acceptance of Abraham and everybody who was accepted by him, loved, forgiven, was only on the basis of faith. Abraham was faithful. It is true that Abraham was faithful under trial, but he never gained any credit from God for his works of obedience. God counted him righteous by faith and nothing else. Now, let's look at verse 6 here. It is a very interesting, uh, it is a very interesting term, a very key term in all the Bible that we find in verse 6. It says this, Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteous. Now, earlier we talked about verses 15 and 16 where it talks about justified. We talked about being a sinner and justified at the same time. This is very close meaning here, but it's a slightly, slightly different shade of this meaning, which is so important. It says counted righteous. That is, this is, a, uh, this is an accounting term. So it is, it is, he was credited righteousness. That is, if, as somebody explained it this way, is if you earned a million dollars, and then you went and transferred that million dollars onto my account. Now I have the million dollars. It's in my account. I own it. And so this transfer, this is, this is credit. Someone is credited something that he didn't earn, but he receives. Now, the book of Romans explains this very, very similarly. If you go with me to book of Romans chapter 4, we find the very same exact argument in Romans chapter 4, verse 3, where Paul is talking about Abraham, and he is talking about the same wonderful, strange thing of someone who has not earned his right to be just, forgiven, accepted, and yet is credited that 
not on the basis of anything that he has done in verse 3 of chapter 4. It says this, For what does the Scripture say? Again, Paul is re- teaching us to read Scripture through the Gospel. He says, and it says next, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. So, Paul here is quoting from the Old Testament. He is quoting from Genesis, where God is giving a promise to Abraham. And Abraham believes God, and that, it says right after it says that Abraham believes God, God counts him as righteous. He is counting righteousness to him, credits righteousness to him. Now, what did Abraham do? He believed God. And some look at this and they say, well, this is a work. He believes God. And this is a very profound misunderstanding of what faith is. The essence of faith is is not doing. The essence of faith is relying on someone else because you can't do it. This is trusting God, relying on God, that He is He will accomplish the good purposes. He will do what He says for your life. Faith is a child who who doesn't know how to swim, jumping into a swimming pool where his father is standing with his arms extended, ready to catch him. This is faith. It is not a work, but a reliance on God. This is Abraham. God made Abraham a a promise, as you remember. God, in fact, we, he took Abraham outside. In the middle of the night, he showed him the stars and he said, this will be your descendants. And through your descendants, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And just feel the, the tension, feel the contrast. Abraham is an old man. Sarah is an elderly woman. When she was of child-bearing age, she was infertile, and now they're both old, and God says, you will have a child by Sarah. You will... So, Abraham there, he, he understands that he's his old, that the time to bear children is gone. They're both old. So, what does Abraham do? What work does he do? He does nothing. All that happens in that passage is that Abraham relies God. He trusts that God will fulfill his promise for him and that God will bless the world through him and through his descendants. So he trusts God. He relies on God, that God will do what he promised. And as Abraham believes and trusts himself to God, he is accepted as righteous. He is credited righteousness. He is viewed as one who is righteous, accepted, loved. And this is the marvelous thing about the gospel. It is, uh, it is hard for us to see this, understand this, and live by this because we live in a someone who earns kind of righteousness. But we see that from the beginning and throughout the Scripture, God accepts us, not on the basis of what we have earned, but on the basis of our trusting in Him and saying we can't accomplish the good purposes in our life for ourselves. But you can. We trust in you. So, in verse 7 here, Paul says, Now, then, that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. This is very interesting because it is not those who are circumcised, but Paul says it is those who are of faith, who have the same type of faith and reliance on God 
are the sons of Abraham. Now, let's look at verse 8 now. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, In you shall all the nations be blessed. How, is, how are the nations blessed through Abraham? And the blessing that is described here is that everyone who comes to God will be accepted by faith. This is the blessing. The Gentiles will be justified by faith. That is the blessing that is being talked about here. This is the, new, the good news that Abraham received himself, that he was accepted by God because of his faith, not because of his works. He knew that he was accepted by God, by his faith. God's promise also included the faith that Abraham had was in a promise that included a descendant, a descendant who will come. And, and in that, in you, is the descendant that God would provide, God would bless all the nations. So faith in God and faith in His promise of the future blessing that will come through Abraham's son are intertwined. So you, you have faith in God. Abraham has faith in God and he has faith in the future blessing that God will bring through him, through his, through his descendant. And all of that is intertwined to give Abraham faith. So as Abraham finally holds Isaac, this child, the promised child that he was waiting for, Abraham knows that through this child, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And of course, Abraham does not know all of the details, all of the details of the lineage that will produce the great child who will indeed save the world. But Abraham, as he is looking at this child, he knows that God has kept his promise and he is rejoicing in this child who will bring blessing to the world. In fact, we have a very interesting passage in John 8, 56. Jesus is saying this, this enigmatic statement to, to the Jews. He says, your father Abraham, John 8, 56, he says, your father Abraham rejoiced at the thought of seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. Wow. And that got everybody confused. What, the, what do you mean? He saw it and was glad. And it's not that Abraham knew about Jesus and all of the details. It's not that Abraham was looking from heaven and rejoicing. It is that Abraham was looking at this child who is the promised child who will produce the blessing to the whole world through him, through his lineage. Christ would come. And Abraham experienced some of that flavor of rejoicing in the, in the promise fulfilled. So if the gospel was preached to Abraham and if he was saved by faith, by believing in God and being counted as righteous and perfect in God's eyes, then that is found throughout the whole Bible. God doesn't have two ways for us to be saved. If we read the scripture without it, if we read the scripture without reading it through the gospel, we will read it to our harm. This is very important. If we read the scripture, if we read through the Old Testament, a lot of you started a Bible reading plan, but if you read it in a way without seeing it through the gospel, then you will read it to your harm. Um, if you, you will see moral examples to follow. Uh, you will see moral examples to imitate. You will look at David defeating Goliath and you will say, what a fine chap. I need to go and defeat the giants in my life. Instead of seeing that God delivers his people through a very unlikely person. Instead of seeing that David actually says that I come out without armor, but I rely on God who delivers. And God is delivering His people through a young person 
who nobody believes would do anything against the giant. And this is, this is the narrative of Scripture. This is very similar to the deliverance that we see later on in Scripture. Old Testament is all about the promised blessing that will come and make things right. So it is the gospel that allows us to understand the Bible fully. It is allowing us to understand the Bible in the way that it was intended to be understood. The tabernacle is all about Jesus Christ who comes later to tabernacle amongst us. The sacrifices are about Him. If you read through Leviticus, it is a very tedious book to read through, I know. But then you see all of these things that point to a sacrifice, the, the only true, meaningful, or the only powerful sacrifice that once and for all is able to liberate. You see as you read these two birds brought, one is sacrificed and the other one is released and let go all of these all of these things are pointing to the great sacrifice that will come to Christ all of the rules in levitical all of the laws if you read the if you read the 10 commandments and you say i'm going to try hard to do them now i think i got this i think i'll be i'll try very hard to do this then you're missing the point of the 10 commandments they were First and foremost, their intention is to bring us to conclusion to say that I cannot do this on my own. Just think about the 10th commandment or any other commandment. We, the, the standard of God's righteousness, we will never be able to attend. And then this is the danger, I think, with us Christians so often is that we start by faith, which is we, we start our journey by faith, but then we rely on working really, really hard to be sanctified. And this is the next thing I'm going to talk about. But what we need to see that all of the Scripture was re- written for us so that we would read it through the lens of the Gospel. As Paul is teaching us in this text that God preached the Gospel to Abraham. So, as, uh, as we look at this first thing, the second thing that I wanted to, to point out from the text that we read is that not only do we understand Scripture from the Gospel, through the Gospel, but we can advance in faith only through the Gospel. So we understand Scripture only through the Gospel, but we can advance in faith only through the Gospel. And this is what I referred to earlier, but let's uh, read from, uh, I'm going to go a little bit higher to verse 1. Galatians 3, 1. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplied the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Now, verse 9, So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of God, of faith. For all who rely on works of the law are under a curse." I've already mentioned this, that there is this unspoken thing deep inside of our hearts that, we're, when we, that we start our journey of faith by relying on God, but we go through the process of sanctification by trying really, really hard in order to obey God and be sanctified. Something happens all of a sudden in somewhere or very often in our journey of faith that we start relying suddenly on ourselves and not on faith, on our works. We start it right, but in our foolishness, as Paul is using this term here, here, we end up relying on our works. And so as we do that, it's interesting that Paul is bringing this idea of a curse, which we'll look at next time more, care, uh, more closely. But we inevitably, as we fall into this works acceptance, 
we inevitably feel and walk as though under a curse, under a burden. And so what Paul is saying here, your faith started when you, if you look with me uh, here, he says Christ in verse 1, Christ was portrayed That word there is he is graphically seen as crucified. Paul didn't uh, didn't preach just doctrines. He didn't preach uh, some statements. He preached about a person who died. And and as they listened, they were able to see it. Not everyone who hears of Christ is able to see that it is Christ Christ. Indeed, it is Him who takes care of my sinfulness, who can takes care of my daily failing in following Him. It is Christ, and He says, you saw Christ. You saw Him crucified. And now He says, you receive the Spirit, and so, but you no longer walk by relying on your works, but go back and see in Christ. So our progress in faith and sanctification is not that we saw Christ and now we try really hard to be sanctified, but, sanctified, but we kept going back or we again and again go back to looking at Christ who has been crucified for our sins. And in that is our daily battle. In that, in seeing Christ crucified, in seeing Christ who is covering our failures and sins, covering our brokenness, covering our incompleteness, in that we find strength to to be able to live. Remember how Job says, he says this term, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my my eye sees you. What is, what is he talking about? Job, he didn't see God. He heard God spoke to him. But there is this seeing that happens with Job. He all of a sudden now starts to see God differently. And this is the seeing that Paul is talking about. He's saying you saw Christ. Spiritually, you saw him do for you something that no one could do. Keep looking and keep seeing that Christ who was crucified for you. So your advancement in Christianity comes not from trying harder, but from believing. Have you noticed how when you get angry uh, or bitter at someone, it is, it is usually because that someone hasn't given something to you it's either they didn't give you attention or care or love or respect and you feel you feel robbed or incomplete or worthless and you are you need that in order to feel complete whatever they didn't give you and that sense of well-being that self that sense of completeness is shattered sometimes it's just like a micro shattering or micro fracture and sometimes it's like a big open fracture and it hurts but all of that comes from that sense of being feeling incomplete that someone has not given you something that was due and you expected them to do but when you know christ when you see christ you can say i don't have to have that i have him he completes me i don't need whatever that is that i am that I am seeking or uh, that I need. Think of, think of a, a someone who is maybe struggling with, with, with spending or with having ha, to curb their spending. And very often, it can be many different reasons, but it could be that as they're looking at others or as they're looking at themselves, they are trying to fulfill the, some incompleteness. They are purchasing. They cannot stop purchasing because they want to feel that void of incompleteness that's deep within them. And maybe it's another car or something else that will complete that void that they feel that is inside of them. So don't you see how the gospel, the gospel of seeing Christ who, through whom we are accepted by faith by God, we are complete, allows us, allows us to live differently and advance through our faith. Our faith is a very rational faith, but it allows us and it requires us to think deeply about our motives, 
to think deeply about why we want to do certain things. Why do we get angry? Why and how do we deal with that? And all of that is found, the solution is found in the gospel. And the more we rely on the gospel by faith, the more we rely on God who accepts us, not based on how we achieve, uh, how much we achieved, but based on our faith and reliance on Him, we are able to overcome. Why do people curse? Often people curse because they feel as though they are as though they're under a curse that everything is against them. And often we find ourselves walking under this sense of a curse in our life as if everything is against us. I was talking to, before I finish, I want to I uh, mention something that I heard this, this week. I was praying uh, during our morning prayer um, at church. I was praying with an older, older, older gentleman, and he was talking about how he was born in Africa to missionary families, a family, and there was this girl that was older, that was adopted, taking care of him. And this girl from an African tribe that they adopted, she was a twin and was considered under a curse. In that tribe, they seriously considered and thought of twins as bringing a curse. They were from the devil. And so she was thrown out by her parents and the, this missionary family adopted her. So, and, and think of this, having this child, and, uh, when the parents threw you out, when all of the relatives think that you are of the devil, you're cursed, how do you explain to a child, how do you explain that away to a child? How do you explain away to yourself that you don't need to be walking under a curse? How do you, because it's a status thing, it's the way you view yourself. And the only way we are able to understand this is when we see that it is Christ who takes away our curse. Again, next time we'll probably look a little bit closer in this text where it says that Christ redeems us from the curse of the law in verse 13 by becoming a curse for us. Christ is the one who takes our curse. And in Him, we are able to walk and receive the blessing, that contrast that I mentioned in the beginning, that the blessing comes to those who rely and put their faith in God just as Abraham did. And in that, we find freedom. In that, we find an ability to follow God and be blessed in our life. Why don't you rise with me and we will pray to God and thank Him for what He has done for us. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful to You for the gift of Your Son, Jesus. We thank You that again and again through this book You're showing us that Faith in you and your grace is a gift from you. You give us faith, you give us grace, just as Abraham believed you and was blessed, counted righteous before you. We too, even though it's hard for us to understand this, it is hard for us to fully live by it daily, follow it by faith, we ask that you would change our hearts to rely on you, that your blessing to us comes not because of who we are, but because of what Christ has done for us. I pray that this would change our life, that it would sanctify us, that as we look at Christ, the initiator of our faith, that we would also continue seeing Christ through our spiritual sight and to be blessed and sanctified through that. It is in your Son's name we pray. Amen.